We've seen in Ezekiel that in his purpose, and we started out with the commission of Ezekiel in chapters 1 to 24, and we discussed yesterday, and uh, I was really, I'm being very candid, I was really impressed with the fact of uh, how quick and how eager and how much you guys have really learned about what Ezekiel is saying to each one of us in that it's so important where we start so strategic in ministry we saw the judgment upon uh, acted out of the siege of Jerusalem in chapter 4 uh, we saw we also the uh, dispersion and the division of the people and how some would die in Jerusalem some outside the city others would be scattered to the wind but God always had his remnant of his people to work by the way that's exciting especially if you go into missions and I pray to God many of you will it's exciting to know anywhere you go in the world there's a remnant at least a remnant of God's people now, I'm surprised sometimes at my American brothers and sisters that somehow thought, why I don't know, that uh, in the former Soviet Union, it was all pagan. And let me tell you, the church that was there, uh, if you were in the church there under communism, there's no question. You were a believer or you were a fool. Okay? One or the other. And uh, brothers and sisters there, wherever you go in the world, isn't it wonderful to know God has his remnant of people. There are those there. And we also saw that in chapter 6 that uh, God would remove the pagan and the corruption and so forth. I hope that's an encouragement to you even in this country. Someday God's going to remove all the junk. And uh, that will be wonderful. And to know also, in their case, they recognize that this judgment of God always, and I hope you've seen it by now, you just cannot get away from it in Ezekiel, always the discipline, the judgment, the work of God has a purpose. Which is what? Know to know Yahweh. <laughs> Boy, if we, if we don't get that message by the time we're through, we... You know, there's something wrong with our eyes or our ears or our head or something. I don't know where it is, but uh, it just keeps coming at you, uh, over and over and over again. You certainly get the idea that God wants us to know him intimately. As he wants the unbeliever to know him. He wants the foreign nations to know him. He wants we who are believers to experientially continue to know him. Uh, that's important relation with God and a, not, and an experiential walk with him yes. in, in that regard given that Ezekiel and God's revelation there is continuously of a judgment it's I'm going to judge you so that you will know that I am God how do you you know on a practical level how do you incorporate that without you know particularly in American culture appearing you know judgmental or very negative I mean obviously our entire society the whole emphasis of much of Christendom is positive, positive, positive. God loves you, God, you know, and, and yet God is clearly revealing in Ezekiel that it's through his judgment. And so often we find situations where like a child dies or some tragedy occurs and people immediately go, you know, where is God? I, and the response is completely opposite. And I think that's because it has been a lopsided presentation. Uh, one response, I mean, there's several things in that. First of all, just in that respect, that emphasizes why we need to teach the whole of the Word of God. You know, preach expositionally, men. That's not to say you never preach topically. But for me, the danger of topical preaching is I'll preach what I like and the topics I'm interested in. Not that they're bad. You know, that's not the issue. But the, fa the problem is, I will not teach the rest of it. And when I, do, when I go through a book, it forces me to tell all of what God's saying. Not just the things that I might want to camp on at that point. 
Uh, I think also I would present this expositionally, and I've done this as you probably noticed even here at times. Uh, in our society today, the word judgment is highly negative. Okay? Uh, and therefore, sometimes people go, immediately their ears close. I don't want to listen to that. You know, that's judgment. You know, how can God be, you know, and they, you, you know all the routines they go through. So, why not uh, use a word, and, and I'm not saying this the only one, why don't we use the word discipline? Because the judgment of God here, as we've seen, has, has two aspects to it. One, and primarily because of this purpose, is corrective. That's the primary purpose. And that's the purpose of discipline. Uh, I see no problem using, in, a, in that sense, a more contemporary term that speaks more uh, in some ways accurately to them of the issue. Yes, there is the penal aspect of judgment. But that's only when a person simply finally says after many, many, many times, no, 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 no! <laughs> you know? And God says basically with a sad heart, and we're going to see that here in chapter 18, I don't desire that anybody die. I don't want that. But if you choose to do that, it's your choice. By the way, that's what I always tell the person that says, why did God send anybody to hell? He doesn't. You send yourself. He wants you not to go there. You know? And he's done everything possible where you don't have to. And that's what, you know, that's the whole corrective aspect. He doesn't want that. He wants his people to walk in his way. He wants the, 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 the non-believer and all of the corruption and all of the, the problems that he faces to be delivered from that. That's why he came. That's what, that's what he wants. He's not going around saying, well, I, I sent my son to die for your sin and all this, but I really don't care whether you accept it or not. You know, you, you think about that a while, that doesn't, doesn't make much sense. Uh, so, I'm simply, I think I would put it, couch it in terminology. Go, go, to, go to Hebrews 12, talk about the issue of discipline, which is a manifestation of a father's love. Uh, so I think we need to take those, con those types of things and help the people begin to see uh, a balance, if we could put it that way. But you're absolutely right. That's, uh, we live in a society that, well, I told you about the seminary student didn't want to preach on justice, <laughs> you know, even, even at that point, because we live in a culture that's affected us. So we... We come to the eminency and, and the comprehensiveness in chapter 7. And we come to 8 uh, through 11. We have the visions here. What, what really is, what's happening in chapters 8 to 11? Just, uh, okay. The sin of the leadership uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, the focus is more upon the leadership. And uh, I hope you begin to see that. It's, it's not something that's just kind of somebody's blowing a big, you know, loud speaker at you. But constantly we're seeing as we go along, leaders stick up, you know. Hey, behind all this, it's very significant that there's been leaders that have been leading the people astray. And uh, leadership is strategic. So the focus is more here upon leadership. Uh, and what, what else happens here in 8 to 11? He's transported in this, in this vision to Jerusalem. Yes. God All right, the thematic aspect that is a significant part, it's not the only theme in, in Ezekiel, but it's another picture that he uses of God's glory departs, why? Because the judgment's coming, and when the, and, and we'll find out, we haven't gotten there yet, uh, but when the uh, judgment, which there's a constant emphasis that we're starting to see of cleansing, in other words, purification, when the people, when all this, this crud of sin is cleansed and the people return to God, he will bring them back to the land of blessing and the glory of God will return. 
in the presence of his people and dwell with his people. So the glory departs because the judgment come, and we saw the judgment represented in what way? How was that in the vision? What happened? Okay. Okay. Did everybody die? Okay, man with a writing case, very important. <laughs> Don't forget him. You're one of them. <laughs> you know, he goes and makes the mark upon those who uh, hearts who basically uh, uh, confessed, were ashamed, uh, were did not uh, thought the what was going on was absolutely wrong. They were those who were righteous, following God's way, and He marked them, and they lived. But the others died. Very visual picture for them. And then the, we have the continual removal of the glory of God. With the, the continued emphasis upon the pardons of, uh, or the why that was taking place with the judgment. Upon specifically, uh, upon the nation but with emphasis upon the leadership and what they've done. When we come to 12 to uh, Chapters uh, 12 to 19, what, as we've talked here, what's going on? Yeah, a little hint on the board here. But. Okay. The exiles, it, what we have reflected here is that the exiles uh, just still don't, either they don't get it or they don't want it. Probably a combination of both. They you know, this can't really be right. So in chapter 12, what happens? Okay. He uh, comes back, and, and notice this, by the way, it's a good, good principle for teaching and preaching. Repetition's wonderful. People, you know, let me tell you a story. I'll tell you this real quick. Uh, and I'm told this is a true story. Uh, it was told to me, so it's not firsthand with me. That there was a pastor that came to this church. He was a new pastor. Uh, the church had called in. And uh, he came to the church, and he, um, the first Sunday there, he preached his message, and everybody was absolutely thrilled. It was a marvelous message as he stood at the door and people were leaving. Everybody saying, oh, pastor, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, we've been longing for, you know, good messages. And and this was just wonderful, and we really appreciate it greatly. You know, you know that kind of talk that goes on as you stand at the door, and you're thinking, you know. anyhow. And so the next Sunday came, and he came to the pulpit, he stood up, and he preached his message, and he preached the same message. Well, everybody kind of thought that was a little strange. Uh, but as people left the, you know, the church, they... Well, I appreciate the, you know, the message. Uh, it, was, it was a good reminder of uh, last week. Uh, you know, a little bit uh, strained comments that took place. And uh, so the third week he stood up in the pulpit and preached the same message. There wasn't much, many comments as people left that day. And the elder board called him in and said, you know, Pastor... Uh, this is a wonderful message and we appreciate it, but uh, uh, I think probably we need to have uh, some other messages. And he says, well, he says, uh, there will be as soon as you start applying this one. So maybe sometimes we need to repeat. I've often thought about doing that. You know? I'll tell you, get their attention. I've also thought sometimes about doing some of the things the prophets do and <laughs> get their attentions too, especially if I did stuff Ezekiel does. <laughs> I've often thought about giving one of Haggai's messages that's about five words. The Lord is with you. And then sit down and see what happens. See how people respond. Uh, is that all? Uh, uh, nothing else? You know, you know, can you imagine the kind of response you might get? Uh, but repetition is wonderful. You know why? Because we don't remember. By the way, if you want a good study sometime, do a study of, the, of remembrance in the scripture. I'll just give you a little hint. We frequently, normally forget. God always remembers. It's an interesting study. 
about remembrance. And that's why, by the way, we have things like the Lord's table. You know, and you tell this very clearly. Do this, why? In remembrance, because I know you're going to forget what I did on the cross, which is so strategic to your life, if you don't keep reminding yourself. That's why they had the picture lessons in the Old Testament, all the sacrifices and the feasts and so forth. Because we so quickly forget. Let me tell you, you quickly forget. I can study a passage, I can spend time on it, and I think, man, I'll never forget this. Just give me two weeks. See what? Well, wait, wait a minute! I gotta go back and look at that again. You know, I don't know about. And by the way, just for a word of encouragement, it gets worse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I don't know what the rest of Ezekiel has to say. <laughs> but uh, we we need to be reminded. So repetition's not bad, okay? And we need to keep reminding our people. And certainly Ezekiel keeps reminding us. And you may say even with Ezekiel after a while, you know, okay, guy, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Until next week. Okay? And uh, he keeps reminding us of this. Or right, as we come, uh, the people, what happens in chapter 13? What's the problem there? What's wrong with the prophets? Okay, you've got the false prophets who have a message that's contrary to Ezekiel. And in essence, it's like, hey, everybody else, the majority, say this. Why should we believe you? I don't know if you've ever been there in that place. I've been there. And yeah, I'll tell you, you know, you, you want to, there's a temptation at times to quit. I understand Jeremiah. Ain't nobody listens. Nobody wants to pay attention to it. Hey, hey, Lefroy, let's go home. Yeah. No, we need to keep repeating <laughs> the message. So we see God delineating the nature of the false prophets, as we talked about yesterday, which are instructive to us so we know that we don't do what we're thinking. We don't speak our own imaginations. We must hear God first and speak what he says, not what we want to say. That means I've got to be in the word of God. I don't just come up with a message on Saturday night when I'm in a rush and I never open my Bible and I write up a message and I deliver it. If that's what you're doing, and we've all been there, if you haven't, you will be, probably. Then we, not, we realize we're too busy, men. That's not what God's called us to do. No. God's called us to, to study the word. And I fight that. You'll fight it the rest of your life. We live in a fast-paced society that will engulf you with activity. And with good things to do. And I live in even, if you can believe it, a faster-paced society in Moscow. It's unbelievable. Man, it's hard to stay up. As I said in our church, I feel like God is a rampaging bull, and we're holding on trying to stay up with him. You know, And even God's moving fast there. Uh, that's exciting. But uh, it, you have to be disciplined because we have to speak what God says. Not our thoughts, as good as they may be. Okay. Chapter 14, what happens here? What are the leaders doing? All right, they have idols in their hearts, and yet they're wanting to come and inquire of God. And God says, I don't give direction to those who come to me with idols they're worshiping in their heart where their focus is upon other gods in their, in their concept of the word. What does he say in the latter part of chapter 14? Why does he talk about Noah and Daniel and Job? They thought, well, if we just have a righteous guy, somebody can do this for us. You know, like one of those guys... And God points out, no. They would deliver themselves, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And they did in their situations. 
but they weren't able to deliver anybody else because we all are responsible concerning whether we're righteous or not is our decisions of how we respond and how we follow God. I do not rely upon other people to do that substitutionarily for me. The only one that's made it possible for me to even be righteous, there's only one. And that's Jesus, the Messiah. For the Old Testament people, they look forward to the Messiah who would come and what he would do. We look back with the same thing for salvation by faith. Uh, everybody has always been saved by faith. Never in any other way. It's by faith in the Messiah. Whether you're looking forward by faith or whether you're looking back by faith. Well, chapter 15. Why the imagery of the vine? useless for building but for producing fruit which unfortunately they were not able to do okay so not only is it uh, that but you know the question is they could so to speak underlying this well aren't we the vine aren't we the chosen vine the choice vine of God that imagery has been used before so it was not uncommon and they would understand that imagery or at least they should and he's saying, look, as it's been stated so clearly, the vine's purpose is to produce fruit. Otherwise, it's essentially useless except as fuel for a fire. It's just no good for building, for even having a peg to hang your clothes, uh, and so forth. It's too soft, it's too crooked, etc. And therefore, since you have not been productive, fruitfully the only other usefulness is to burn as fuel for the fire of judgment and you will burn because God is coming well but but do you really mean that are we really that bad and how does he describe how bad they really are in chapter 16 they're like a spiritual prostitute an adulteress and the basic concept underlying that, especially the aspect and the issue of, adulterous, of adultery, is unfaithfulness in a relationship. Their relationship is to be with God. They are not to be adulterous with God. They are not to go and worship other gods in a relationship with other gods enter into relationships with even other nations for security they're depend upon God for security uh, when we walk away from God when we turn and do not depend upon him and do not trust him and are unfaithful maybe this will uh, bring us up short and and shock us a little bit but today we are spiritually committing adultery I don't know if you ever thought of yourself as an adulteress. But we are spiritually. It's no different when we're unfaithful to God. When we do not trust him and totally depend upon him and remain in every possible way we can in that intimate relationship with him. And there's no better place to be. Why would we ever want to have other relationships? I can guarantee you it's not God's fault. It's our fault. No, we can't blame him. Chapter 17, we had the riddle and the extended metaphor of these uh, two eagles. What are they telling us about? Okay, uh, who's the first eagle? Let's, let's don't get too eager for the eagle. <laughs> Okay, the first one is, is Babylon. It's Nebuchadnezzar who comes and takes the leadership from the Messianic line to Babylon. And they're there. And then he takes uh, out of the royal line some seed and plants it, Zedekiah, into the land. And what happens is the figure is a vine grows, but it faces toward, towards Babylon. And if it does so, it's prosperous. So as long as Zedekiah is the vassal, 
uh, and follows the leadership of Babylon, things are okay there in the sense of the word. Okay? But then this other ego came flying by. This was represented by Egypt. Good. And uh, what's the problem there? Okay, the branch starts to go through that. And what historically is going on here, which this is a, a visual representation of? Okay, Egypt uh, is, is always wanted to control. And Egypt would love to have Judah. And the pharaohs, as we're going to see, uh, Hophra and uh, Basamic, uh, they, they would like to do that. And there are overtures and there's rumors. We're going to see that again shortly uh, of this. And, and the hope of the people in exile way over there, you know, in Mesopotamia are, we'd like to go home. <laughs> I don't think they're wanting to go home just because of God. They want to go home. You know? And uh, therefore, we've got to get out of this uh, captivity kind of prison we're in. And uh, we need somebody over there to help us out. Come, somebody around here help us? Ah, there's Egypt. And Egypt looks like maybe they're going to, you know, rise up and, and they, they will defeat uh, Babylon. And we get to go home. And so, boy, when they see this and Zedekiah being over there in hometown Jerusalem, he has the same perspective. And so he turns pro-Egypt. As the picture is showing us. And what happens to the vine? Yeah, Visually in this figure what happens? The vine does what? Withers. Withers. Because it's going to be fruit. Because God says right now I want you to submit to Babylon. This is the discipline. If you turn over here. You're going to wither. And that's exactly what happened. And of course, Zedekiah will be taken into captivity along with the people in 586 in the third deep, <clears throat> pardon me, in the third deportation. Chapter 18. Well, if, uh, if that's true, if, our, if what we read in chapter 16 is true in our history, uh, and if uh, Zedekiah is bad in judgment, uh, aren't we still being judged for what's happened and, and we're not really responsible at this time? You know, after all, uh, you know, we, we uh, doesn't, 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 the, doesn't the Bible back there somewhere in Exodus say, you know, the people, the sons to the third and fourth generation, you know, that's a hereditary thing? And uh, you're either righteous or you're not. Well, we begin and he says, what the word of the Lord came to me. What do the people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? Got all these proverbs. They're interesting ones. The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Or actually it would be better rendering they're, they're blunt. I don't know how often you eat grapes. I am, my wife and I are delighting for the few weeks we have to eat seedless grapes um, before we go back to those that have seeds. But when you eat the seeds all the time, it can kind of wear down a little bit on your teeth. Okay? So if my father eats it, my teeth get blunted. What's, what's the concept there? Not fair. Well, it's not fair, but what's happening? If my father eats the grapes, but my teeth are blunted, Okay. okay, what he does, I, get, I have to pay the penalty for. I get the consequences. Okay, I'm inheriting that from him. I'm having to pay for what he did. And so that's, if that's the proverb, that's what they're thinking. Okay, I, we, after all, it's not fair. We're having to pay now for what they did then. Uh, men, that's a common concept in psychology today. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't quite got the rest of the story in most cases. Uh, yes, I can be affected 
by my father, and as I implied to you, I think that's the basic concept in the Exodus passage, is yes, sin is passed down, or at least modeled, I'd rather use the term, it's modeled for us by our parents. I see things still in my life that are remnants of my parents. Most of them are good. Some of them aren't. Okay? Now what do I do with the some that aren't? I have the opportunity to make a decision to change in the power of the Spirit of God. Okay? I cannot do it myself, but in the power of God's Spirit, with God's strength by faith, I can make decisions to do what's right and trust God. I can abort the process, so to speak, at that point. So I don't have to stay there. But today it's as if, well, if that happened, I'm sorry, that's just the way you are and the suffering you have today is because of your parents and woe to you and go back and dig up as much dirt as you can find so you can understand how dirty you are, but I'll never tell you how to get clean. That's the problem. Never tell you how to get clean. Well, we need to tell people how do they get clean in this situation. So we have here a, this proverb that uh, gives us this perspective. Uh, and what it produces is an irresponsible fatalism. Well, that's just the way I am. That's the way I always will be. So I'm stuck. So what difference does it make? What are you preaching all this stuff about? I mean, that's the way I am. I can't change. Well, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean you can't change? But I hear that all the time. I'm sure you hear that here. You know, I can't change. That's just the way my, my parents, they did this, that. I, this happened to me. This is the way I am. I'll never be the same. Uh, it'll affect me for, they don't say this, usually eternity, but I mean, that's almost <laughs> what's in mind. Now, it'll be forever as far as they understand forever. Uh, a lot of them don't understand that very well. And so it's as if, you know, righteousness and wickedness are hereditary. If my parents are righteous, I'll be righteous. If my parents were wicked, I'll be wicked. What can I do about it? Okay. By the way, there's thoughts about that also even in the church. You know, well, after all, your parents were, were wonderful Christians and, you know, no wonder you're so wonderful. Well, I've seen people that parents were in prison and they were corrupt and they were divorced and there was uh, sexual perversions and there was drug dealing and you can go down the line and those guys accept the Christ, the children and they're just marvelous, righteous believers. And that's exactly what this passage is going to talk about. Because he's going to talk about the fact that you can no longer quote this proverb because the principle is each person lives or dies, and this is in, in, in the physical sense here, according to his own actions. He either, the person is right, doing what is righteous or not doing what is righteous according to the decisions they make. That they're, they're, they're free to make a decision to walk in God's way or not to walk in God's way. It's an individual responsibility for the person. And as I said, this is, this is a concept we don't have often in the Old Testament where it's talking about individuality because most of it is corporate. And that's, by the way, I could spend a lot of time talking about that because I think we've lost the corporateness of God's people in many ways in this day. Uh, but the, the principle of individual responsibility has always been true. It's not something new here. And as, he, as we're told, the soul who sins is the one who will die. Uh, it's, it's that person. If you don't, if you change your way. So he gives three examples here. He takes this situation and he, does, he gives illustrations beginning in verse 5 with a, a righteous father, an unrighteous son, and a righteous grandson. We have a three generation. And he's going to take each relationship. So he starts with the righteous, fa the righteous father. And please note, I th think one of the things that's wonderful here 
is to begin to note what are the descriptions of a righteous man. Because we have a little description here. It's not exhaustive. Okay, let me quickly say. This is not exhaustive. But the thing I want us to observe is it's not a doctrinal statement. You're righteous because you believe A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, hear me out to the end here. You need to believe A, B, C, D, E, you know, you need to believe the right thing. But, a person is evaluated by their attitudes and their actions, which should be manifesting the right biblical theology. See? We don't normally think of it that way, especially in academic context. So, Suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right, verse 5. And what is that? He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of the house of Israel. First thing is, he refrains himself from being involved in pagan or other types of religions and idolatry. Okay? That's a righteous man. That's what he does. Secondly, he does not defile his neighbor's wife or lie with a woman during her period. That's being righteous? You betcha. Interesting to think about at that point. What else is righteous? He returns what he took in pledge for a loan. Oh. <laughs> I, you know, I got to do that? Yeah. And by the way, if you took in pledge a, a cloak or garment, and that's what they use as their blanket at night, you need to give it to them before nightfall. But how do I know? You know, where'd my collateral go at that point? You know, we're so concerned about our money. So how are you? How are you responding to people? He does not commit robbery. Oh well, we understand that one. Of course, nobody won't do that. But gives his food to the hungry. Uh, <clears throat> wow, got to do that. Remember calling up. My daughter's getting into this thing here. I remember calling up, uh, we were calling up talking to my daughter in Philadelphia when we were in Vienna. One time we asked her, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm making sandwiches. Oh, are you having a party? No. Oh, are you, is this for lunch? No, I'm making a bunch of sandwiches. Oh. She said, well, I put them in the freezer and then each day I take a few of them, I put them in my purse and as I walk to, as I walk to my school, my work, and it says people in Philadelphia on the street often come up and say, could you give me money for food? And I give them a sandwich. And uh, by the way, I might say by princess, she found out who really was hungry, uh, by who <laughs> took the sandwiches or not. And, uh, but you know, that's practical righteousness. Have we ever thought about doing that? I get convicted frequently in Moscow over that because almost everywhere I work there are people who are begging and rightfully so they need it and I need to demonstrate that by either giving money giving food giving something because God says that's righteous give food to the hungry provides clothing for the naked oh this, this sounds like social work to me yeah it is righteous godly helping society. He does not lend at usury or take excessive interest. Well, how am I going to make a lot of money? Okay. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between man and man. You know, I can't have any biases. Wow. I don't know about this righteous stuff. He follows my decrees. Of course, that's the bottom line. Follows the word of God and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. I just challenge you to periodically go back and read that list about what it, just a brief glimpse, I say it's not exhaustive, brief glimpse of God of what is a righteous man. And the emphasis predominantly is upon what do I do? He says, that's a righteous man and he will surely live, declares the law. Lord, suppose he has a violent son. Now here we come with the unrighteous son. He has a violent son who sheds blood. 
Well, that's certainly unrighteous. Or does any of these other things, though his father has done none of them. So he does everything his father didn't do. You often read of that in the book of Kings, don't you? You know, this king did, did, did and then this king did what was right in the, did, in the eyes of the Lord as David, his father, you know, think of David as the model. Or he did not walk in the ways of his father. You know, when the evaluation is going on with the kings. So you have a righteous king and you have an unrighteous son or the other way around in that. And then he goes right down the line. He eats at the mountain shrine. He defiles his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor and the needy. He commits robbery. He does not return what he took as a pledge. He looks to the idols. He does detestable things. He lends a usury and takes excessive interest. Everything. Right down the line. Exactly the opposite. So the father is righteous. The son is unrighteous. Somehow we miss the DNA here. You know, the heredity thing. It didn't work out. Somehow the uh, eating the grapes and the blunt teeth, uh, something, something's happened here. Teeth, no problem with my teeth. They're okay. But here we have the, we have the fact that this is not a passing down. Will, this, will such a man live? He will not. Because he has done all of these detestable things, he will be put to death and his blood will be on his own hand. But suppose this son, the unrighteous son, had a son who sees all the sins his father commits. And this is the one where we really have to drive it home if you're going to preach it. This is where we come to drive it home. His father was as unrighteous, so to speak, as you could get in the context. He did everything the wrong way. Okay, he sees all that. It's not that he's unaware and said, well, I just didn't know. You know, I've been affected by these things. I didn't know it really happened. No, he knew. All the things his father committed. Though he sees them, he does not do such things. See, you can make a decision. That, by the way, is part of being created in the image of God. We can make decisions. Okay? That's, if I can use this, and this is purely from a human perspective, God took a risk when he created us in his image. Because we could decide for or against. Of course, he wants us to trust him in all of that. And he goes on to talk about the righteous grandson. And he says, he will not die for his father's sins. He will surely live. Now, I think it's interesting because this comes right shortly from the context of going from a Hezekiah to a Manasseh to a Josiah. Of course, got to slip a moan in there somewhere. He didn't quite fit. We have to go jump to the grand, great grandson at this point. But it is kind of interesting uh, that you have that historical parallel uh, that takes place in this. Now, uh, when we come to verse 19, it says, Yet you ask, why does this son not share the guilt of his father? <laughs> okay, good question. Why does he not do that? Since the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. Now we have some, we might call it sub-principles here uh, in 19 to 32. They've asked this rhetorical question, why does a son uh, not, so to speak, have to share or does not share the guilt of his father? Well, first of all, whenever one lives righteously, they will live. That's a principle. If one disobeys the Mosaic Covenant, they live unrighteously, they will die. The wicked could live and ultimately eternally if they trust in the Messiah and turn from their sinful ways and their rebellion and obey God's word. This is very clear. But if in verse 21, a wicked man turns from all his sins and is committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the offenses he's committed will be remembered against him. Because of the righteous things he has done, he will live. And we say, well, it sounds like a work salvation. No. 
just keep in mind we're talking about you know, we're following the righteous principles and if you follow the righteous principles of the law the law will continually point you to the fact that if you aren't in a relationship with God and you haven't circumcised your heart you're not one of us you're not there yet law didn't save them but the law did give picture lessons over and over again the sacrifices and so forth of what's necessary be just like a Joe Q Israelite growing up and this you as we have a constitution in this country or they do in your home country and you live under that and after a while you say I don't think I particularly like some of the laws we have in this land you know in fact uh, I just don't think you really ought to drive 65 miles an hour here. So I think I'll drive 75. I'm sure you never do that. Okay. But, uh, you know, we, we live under that. And after a while, we, you know, decide there's some things we don't like. Well, I can see, that, you know, Joe Q. Israelite, he grows up. And after a while, he says, you know, I find I'm having a hard time doing these things. Well, he is because he's not a believer. You know, as he grown up, and he has all the struggles of that. And though the Constitution is not saying, beep, 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 here's the gospel, it does represent that. I mean, that, it's not, that's not its purpose. But it is showing him something which our Constitutions don't do, how he can be right with God. And it will be by making a decision of faith, to trust that there is one who will sacrifice and give himself as a substitution upon his, for him to pay the penalty of his sins, to bear his sins, so that he might be delivered from that and live. So, if I'm following God's word, then I will know the right way to go. And that's why I say he will be righteous, he will live physically. Ultimately, he'll, if he follows that, he will live eternally. If he's following all of the truth of what is communicated within God's word. Yes. So in verse 4 it says the soul of the sins will die. Talking about the physical death by the Babylonians. Or is that like Romans 3? I think that the death factor is predominantly physical within the book. In fact within the Old Testament is predominantly physical. Living and dying. Now uh, and we have to be careful about eternalizing <laughs> if I can create a word, uh, the concept of uh, live and die. I think we have to work with each context, however. I mean, eternal life and death is in the Old Testament. But again, that's, you have to come back to part of the way in which they think. Uh, they live more in the present, uh, the Hebrew does. Future is something that's out there. You know, alone. Uh, you know, Olam is where? Anywhere from the end of that, end of my desk here to eternity. It's just not right here. So somewhere down there. And, and again, they're more interested conceptually in what things are happening. And so the issue of life and death tends to be more in the sense of present physical. Most of the discussions uh, when we have the word saved or salvation uh, would probably be best rendered delivered. You know, you read in the Psalms, you know, God delivered me out of this situation. Well, he's not, you know, and, and King Jimmy will say saved. And no, he wasn't saved spiritually at that point. He simply is uh, no longer in that situation and that problem. Okay. But you have to work contextually with each situation. I think within Ezekiel it is predominantly a physical aspect. But I want, that's why I wanted to take the moment to say if you really fall it through to the end. And uh, for the guy that's, you know, for the person that if he, why is he doing these things? Because he's had a change of heart, otherwise he wouldn't do it. So the righteous person who comes to the Mosaic Covenant and looks not only at the guidelines of how he is to live, but looks over here at the picture less, lessons of how your life can be changed, and believes that, then he is able to do this, because apart from faith he can't do that. Okay? That was the whole problem. They, couldn't, they could not keep the law unless they were a believer. The problem with the law was not the law. The problem was with people, and the sinfulness of the people. 
to that point. He also discusses here in, uh, in verses 23 and also 32 that God, notice in verse 23, um, do not take any pleasure in the death, I do not take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares Adonai Yahweh. Rather, I am not pleased when they turn from their ways and live. I, pardon me, I am. Am I not pleased, pardon me, when they turn from their ways and live? I think that's very strategic to understand. I've already mentioned that. God does not. He is not happy with the death. His pleasure is when they turn and live. Whether that, and that principle is basically the same, but, but one is on an eternal, eternal plane and one is on a, a more present physical plane. That's true for the non-believer and it's true for the believer. For the non-believer, God does not want them to spend eternity in hell. His pleasure is that they turn and they know him and live for eternity with him. For the believer, God is not excited that a person might die because they just continue to wallow and, you know, to continue to do things that are contrary to his ways. He wants them to turn from that and enjoy the fullness of life that he has for them. That's God's great pleasure. And that's why God's, that's what God wants for us. That's how we please God. And of course, that's another interesting thing to study about. How do you please God? Of course, we go to Hebrews 11 by faith. You know, we can go right down the line with those manners of which, what pleases God. And we see the same concept given us again in verse 32 of the chapter. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone declares Adonai Yahweh, therefore, repent. Make a decision. Change your mind. And live. Live. Live to the full. Live in all the blessing and joy and all that God has for them. It's a decision. It's an individual decision that each one must make. And there's never a time, notice verse, verse 24, but if a righteous man turns from his, his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty and because of the sins he's committed, he will die. There's never a time, and of course Paul mentions this in Romans, there's never a time where a righteous person can feel free to sin. Yeah. Paul says, do we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay. That's not God's way. Okay. The concept of the exiles, after hearing this, look in 25. You say, the way of the Lord is not just. You're not fair. It's not just. Hear, O house of Israel, is my way unjust? Is not your ways, is it not your ways that are unjust? God's reply is, it's Israel way, Israel's ways not his, that are inequitable, that are unjust, that aren't fair. So the responsibility, exiles, no, you're not. And no, the people in Jerusalem will not die because of the sin of their fathers. They can change that. They can repent okay, and live. They have to make a decision, and it's an individual responsibility. Yes. Should this be seen as a change from what was stated in um, the second commandment regarding slash with how he visits the sins? Or is this an explanation? What was, in other words, is this a change in God's policy, or is this an explanation of what God's always been doing? It would almost seem at first read to almost go head on head with um, what God says. I think it's in the second commandment, right? Where he says, 
Texas 25. How do you, how do you reconcile those two? Okay, I, uh, as I've tried to explain, my perspective is, because I think you have real problems throughout Scripture, if you take, if you take the concept of Exodus 20 that a person is going to die and they have no option, it's a done deal, that for the next four generations, if my father sinned, I'm sorry, I've had it and it's it and I'm done for, you know, and I'm going to have to bear those things for him. I have to pay his penalty. This is the, this is arguing in that sense is arguing directly opposite to that interpretation, which makes, should cause us all to say, whoop, wait a minute. I've got a, you know. Houston, I got a problem. You know, <laughs> I've got to deal with this. I've got to. I have to. Have, there's there, there's something that's not right. There's dissonance. And I think if we go back through the scripture, the, through the rest of the scripture, not just this passage, which by the way will be repeated in chapter 33 of Ezekiel, the whole same whole argument, because people still haven't got the point. <laughs> Good old repetition again. Okay, when. We, if we go through this scripture, we will see that the concept that I or we must bear, bear in, a, in a sense of a, if I can put it this way, a substitutionary way, uh, the sins of our fathers and pay the penalty for that is not a valid biblical concept. I find the scriptures arguing in the other direction. Then what is going on in Exodus 20? as he's talking about the consequence here. As I sought to explain, as I look at it, as I see uh, situations with men and their children and sit, uh, in the scriptures, as I see certain exhortations in the Proverbs, as I read certain uh, events that take place within the historical books, it seems to me the concept is that we easily learn from our fathers and our mothers. We should. That's the whole concept. We should learn from them. But we learn both the good and the bad. In fact, I don't know about you. How many of you had children? Okay. You'll find out if you haven't already, they pick up the bad quicker than the good. Oh, man. You know, you see her, you see her looking, you're looking in the mirror. You know, there it is, old brother. I can't believe I communicated that one to them. You know, that's the word they learned. They didn't learn it from anybody else but me. Nobody else around, you know. And they will continue to do it, as I've implied. I still find things in my life, tendencies, to do some things that I would say weren't exactly the best things on the part of um, my parents. Some of that, by and large, I mean, they were wonderful and they were good things. But there are those, none of us are perfect. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, we're, we're, none of us are perfect. And we find those things. Now, do I have to continue to do those? Well, it will, it takes about four generations just, if you want to, if I can use the term, want to use just the natural approach. <laughs> It'll take about three or four generations for it to hopefully kind of just, uh, you know, get so diluted uh, in the process of marriages that uh, it's, you know, it's hardly any effect or of it anymore. But it can be aborted right away at the first generation. I do not need to do that. So I see certain things in my parents, and I say, There's, that's not the way God would have it to be done. Okay, I've got to make a decision and I have to work at it. I have to make that decision every day and trust God through his spirit to enable me to, to follow through with that decision. And I, say, I may have to make the decision 10 times in a day. But what I'm, as I, you know, it, it's like uh, if you guys go to the weight room and work out, you know, first time you do that, uh, you know, you... <laughs> You know, you, you, you just hurt all over and all that stuff. At least I used to. <laughs> Don't do too much of that anymore. I, I should. Um, but, uh, you know, after a while, what? It gets, gets easy. You think, well, I can't believe I have any problem with, you know, with that. Well, as we keep practicing, as we keep doing what is righteous, 
It becomes more a habit of life, and we make the change in that. There's a question about here, yes. Can you define what a righteous man is in this context? Because verse 26 would suggest that he could lose his salvation. Uh, Okay, as I said, the, the back in chapters and verses 5 through 9, he gives us that brief description of what is righteousness. I would say that's not exhaustive. But those were deeds. So I'm trying that's to right. determine here if we're talking about the person's relationship with the Lord as a righteous man having been made righteous through Christ. Could he lose it? And it would appear that he could. <clears throat> In this verse, if all of a sudden he started committing iniquity. Yes, that's why I say, uh, as I look at this, and I often look in the Old Testament, I think it's predominantly, he's talking about life, he's talking about physical life and death. He's not talking about eternal. This is not an eternal spiritual matter. He's speaking to the people of Israel. These are people who uh, should be in a relationship with him. I'm not saying they all were. So in that sense, though these things are outworkings, these are, these are actions, these are acts uh, that he primarily describes as well as some attitudes behind them. These reflect, should be reflecting and are reflecting the attitude of the person. Now, it's the same thing with us. We are declared righteous by God. We, if I were to die at this very moment, I enter into his presence with perfect sanctification. I am perfectly righteous. But I know standing here right before you, my friend, that I ain't perfect. I can guarantee you. Just ask my wife. Okay? If you ever want to find out, ask your wife. And uh, now, I can do in in daily life that which is unrighteous to the extent that I might die. I think the scripture points that out. I think God is saying here as he says throughout the rest of scripture he's going to do everything possible to bring me to a place to where I make decisions to turn from that. That's why discipline comes. That's why the spirit of God brings conviction and so forth today. That's why we have the, the passage in Hebrews 12. Uh, of uh, God bringing discipline with our life. And it's not something that's pleasant. It's not something fun. But it's there because we're not walking in God's way. And we need to be walking righteously rather than unrighteously. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 2. You know, guys, don't, don't do long, any longer what you used to do before you came to know Christ. You know, you can, you can do that. Uh, now, I think, uh, obviously, if we continue to do those things, and I'm not the judge, I can't be the judge at that time, Boy, God is. You know, the, the scripture also points out very clearly, yeah, the question arises, did the person ever really make a commitment? And I think the writer of Hebrews is, is driving home that point. And that's an issue we always need to, in those situations, as we're working with people, and as we see that this is something that's a continuing thing with them, we need to, we need to raise that issue. You know, have you ever... You know, ever consider the fact that you've never personally received Christ. But I, I don't think there's a confliction, uh, confliction, a conflict, to learn English again. Uh, I don't think there's a conflict uh, here in that. When we view it, this is not uh, speaking of one's eternal relationship. This is speaking of one's daily walk in their relationship and ministry in life. And I think undoubtedly there were people in Israel who were non-believers. And uh, they certainly are unable to do that. But there are those who did know what was right and uh, did not live righteously at that point. Mm. Uh, going back to Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, uh, isn't it understood that the Torah didn't handle the individual in a corporate setup? Here Ezekiel is talking to an individual and that's why we see the difference about how a person will not die for a sin. But there it's a corporate setup. And so we have a different thing. So it's more complementary rather than seeing anything contradictory in it. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not uh, contradictory. It is complementary. I, th I think, though, it's, though, yes, undoubtedly, the major thrust and things like this in the, in the Scripture, both old and new, I might add, are corporate. Uh, that there is, the corporate is made up of individuals. 
And so the, the concepts do not change between what is valid for the corporate and what is valid normally for the individual in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, concerning verse 26 of chapter 18 when it says, yes. when the righteous turn, could a modern day or a New Testament application of that be, for example, those in 1 Corinthians 11 who fell asleep because of breaking uh, the communion table? Mm -hmm. And so, they're, so that potentially they were believers, but yet, they God did chastise them by death for turning away from righteousness. Is that sort of what this is connected to? I think so, okay. yes. We come then to the, uh, to the chapter 19. Uh, really lying behind chapter 19 is the, is the question, uh, can, uh, can Zedekiah, who's now the regent, okay? He's the regent there. Uh, okay, uh, so, so you've pointed out that we can make decisions for ourselves. But, you know, uh, Zedekiah is going to throw off the yoke still. We're quite convinced of that. You know, they keep with that. If, my, if one argument doesn't work, I'll come back to another one. You know, and that's, you'll, you'll face that too in ministry. You know, it, there, you'll always try to find some way to weasel out, as we might use the idiom of the situation. Okay, you've told me that uh, it's, we're not judged for the people in the past, uh, that what they've done in the past. Yes, I can make individual changes. Uh, I don't want to, but I can. Uh, I can, uh, it's, you know, yes, uh, the, you say the false prophets are false, and I'm not sure about that, but uh, that they're going to get it. Uh, you know, yes, we're, we're choice people, but you tell me that we're worth, worthless, and yes, you demonstrated in the history of our people that we're prostitutes as a, as a nation that we've committed adultery against God, but, uh, you know, look over there, you know, Zedekiah, he's a pretty good man. You know, maybe, maybe don't, don't you really think uh, he can help us out, that we can trust him? He'll throw off the yoke uh, of Babylon, and, and we can have, we can go home. You know, they're, they're diehards here, you know. And guys, don't be too hard on them. Uh, if you were living in a foreign country and basically in, under house arrest, <laughs> if I can kind of put it that way, I, I don't know how you describe it, and... Uh, would you want to go home? Yeah. Most, at least most of it would, I hope. I, 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 unfortunately, I run into some people, but their countries are so bad, they don't want to go home, which is a sad thing. They really, in one way, would like to, but they don't want to. But yeah, we'd want to go home. That's home. You know, that's what we've known. And, and we're going to, you know, it's, we're, going to tr we're going to try to find some way to get home. And that's what they're doing. The only problem is they're trying the wrong thing. They're thinking that some human thing has to happen to get me home. And God is constantly kind of waving, you know, the, the flag up here uh, of, of deliverance and saying, over here, I'll show you deliverance. Turn, repent. Turn to me, and that's the way you don't have to endure the penalty, you know, the punishment. Over here, anybody? Anybody over here? Everybody's going, oh, we see, G we see Egypt over here. We see the Pharaohs. There's the Zedekiah. Aren't the guys good guys over there in Jerusalem? I've been telling you they're bad guys in Jerusalem. It's all bad. It's corrupt. They're worshiping idols. You know, they're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping the Akkadian deities. I've been showing you all this stuff. Egypt, no. In fact, Pharaoh is going to get sick here pretty soon. and He's not going to do anything. Uh, over here, salvation. Turn to me and you get to go home. No, we want to try it this way. We're still trying. That's because of the sinfulness of man. That's, that's basically what's going on here. You know, these, these exiles are wanting to go home and they just can't believe that, on the other hand, they can't believe that Jerusalem, that Israel, the chosen people of God, are going to no longer be in Israel and Jerusalem will be destroyed. That's beyond their understanding. Let me ask you, can you imagine Washington, D.C. being wiped off the map, the United States lying desolate, 
and most of the Americans no longer here. I can't. Even if I wanted to, I, I, it, I can't do that. It, 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 it's going to have to be some real work here, you know. Well, that's kind of where they are. Yeah, so I say we have to kind of put ourselves in their place. Now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't listen. Because they say it's like God's over here waving a flag and continually answering all the problems and everything else and saying, this is the way, repent and turn to me, and you can go home. You know, you won't experience. They, you know, they, 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 Jerusalem won't collapse if they would do that. And they pay no attention to that. So there's still hope in Zedekiah when we come to chapter 17. And he says to Ezekiel, take up a lament concerning the princes of Israel and say. So he's going to give a lament. He's going to give a, a lament is like a funeral dirge. Okay. And he's going to, he's, a funeral dirge, by the way, is always done after a person dies. Not before they die. Well, this is a, uh, a glimpse of things to come, uh, so to speak. This is an eschatological lament. Uh, in the sense that, uh, and this is, that this is how bad it is, guys. Zedekiah and the guys back there aren't going to make it. Okay? They're going to die. To the extent that I'm going to now give the funeral lament. I'm going to give the dirge before you. I'm going to sing this song. The current ruler, rulers are not worthy of anyone's trust. Is the point that he will want to stress. They will die. And the dirge is now sung over them. Now this, this dirge has interesting factor that there will be imagery. There's imagery initially about a lioness and her cubs. Okay, right, we got the picture, we got, we got a lioness and we have cubs. And so we're going to read, what? A lioness was your mother among the lions. She lay down among the young lions. She reared her cubs. She brought up one of her cubs. He became a strong lion. He learned to tear prey and he devoured men. The nations heard about him. He was trapped in their pit and they led him with hooks to the land of Egypt. Now, I think within the, the whole uh, context here, We'd have to say very clearly because the, the lioness is, ident is identified as the nation. Okay? The nation has cubs. The cubs are the leaders. They're the given kings. Uh, kings often are represented as lions in the ancient Near East. And they often go out lion hunting also in the Near East. So you have the first cub here in verses 3 and 4 uh, in this first section that we've read about. Uh, would be in reference to Jehoahaz. He was the one that was placed there. He was taken to Egypt okay, and removed. He, but he, it tells you about him. He became a strong lion. He learned to tear prey. He devoured people. People heard about him. Armies were sent to trap him. And he was bound and taken to Egypt. Second cub, uh, as we go ahead to read in verses 5 and 6, when she saw her hope unfulfilled, her expectations gone. She took another of her cubs and made him a strong lion. And he prowled among the lions, for he was now a strong lion. He learned to tear prey, and he learned how to devour men. He broke down their strongholds and devastated their towns and the lands and all who were in it and were terrified by his roaring. Then the nations came against him, those from regions round about, and they spread out their nets for him, and he was trapped in their pits. And with hooks they pulled him into a cage and brought him to the king of Babylon. And put him in prison. Well, that's Jehoiachin. Okay? Our interpretive fact, when you are, say very clearly, go to Egypt, go to Babylon, and so forth, we're getting, uh, we're getting very clear interpretive uh, principles and clues on this fact. They put him in prison so that his roar was heard no longer on the mountains of Israel. So he uh, was one that also destroyed mankind. He destroyed cities. He left the land desolate. He was caught in the lion hunting of uh, 597 by Babylon and taken to Babylon there. Uh, notice he's put in prison. Doesn't say he died because he wasn't. He was taken there and he lived uh, for many years uh, within Babylon. But there's no more roar. Okay? Now, when we come to, to 10 to 14, 
So what we're what we're learning here is that well Jehoahaz and Jehoiachin and and these leaders were not those who could be trusted. They did that which was wrong and bad. They they couldn't be trusted. So in 10 to 14, your mother was like a vine. And we switch imagery. This is all still part of the lament and the dirge for them. I'm telling you. Dirge, by the way, usually recounts a little of the history. It's like, a, it's like you go to a memorial service today at a funeral and people will talk about the deceased. And the dirges would talk about them and then and say, you know, this is the, where the person is, so to speak, uh, and the consequences now. So, the imagery changes here to a vine. Now, uh, we say, why? Well, I, I don't know that I can fully answer that question, except that uh, Zedekiah is the one that's going to be the focus now, because he's the next, you know, he's the last one on this, and he was not a legitimate king. So maybe because the lion concept was a king, normally a kingly term, and he was really just a regent who is in the family, uh, perhaps uh, this is the reason why it changes. And the vine puts more emphasis, we would expect, upon the nation at this point. So we're talking about uh, your mother's a vine, and that, again, emphasizing the nation here. And what happens with the nation? Well... Uh, it was planted in the water, became fruitful, full of branches uh, because of uh, water. And basically what he's going to tell us here is that it grew, grew large, became fruitful. And we know it became very fruitful uh, during the kingdom time. The foliage uh, was thick, uh, it became very high, many branches. But in verse 12, uh, we read that it was uprooted. By in fury and thrown to the ground, the east wind made it shrivel. So the, the nation of Israel is shriveling, it's stripped of its fruit, its strong branches withered, and fire consumed them. Now it is planted in the desert. It's in Babylon. Okay. It's been planted in the desert, in a dry and thirsty land. Fire spread from one of its main branches and consumed its fruit. Uh, and and not, no strong branch is left on it fit for a ruler's scepter. Now, boy, if we didn't have that last statement, we'd be kind of struggling on what's this branch <laughs> and what's this fire coming out of the branch and where are we? Okay. But branch is then related that there's the branch or should be someone that could be, have the ruler's scepter. So the imagery here is the vine's the nation, but the branch is the leader or leaders. And the leader that destroyed, it caused the destruction to happen in Jerusalem, the last one is Zedekiah. So most, most uh, probably the fire that spreads from one of the main branches and consumes its fruit uh, would be in reference to the destruction that Zedekiah brought upon Judah. Now, there's no hope here. There's no one to be a ruler there in the land of Israel. No one to rule the vine, the nation. It's rulerless. Uh, we've already got that implication so far. We're going to get it again in chapter 22. There's no one to stand in the gap for the people. Uh, the leadership is corrupt. It's bad. Not only that, we just don't have anybody fit to be one. No one is here fit for the ruler's scepter. What a sad situation. Yeah. Uh, there are today countries that have no one fit for a ruler scepter and probably there's other countries where there's a lot of people who think that the ones they have aren't fit but uh, it's here there really is no one to take that place you cannot trust in your rulers because number one you have none that are fit for it there's none that are going to stand for God you cannot know people you cannot trust he is not to be trusted Zedekiah none of them to throw off the yoke about of, of Babylon and to think that you're going to return here to the land. There's no hope. J judgment 
is coming at this time. There's no strong ruler.